Okay, we are back, recaffeinated and ready for the next two research talks in the program. First, coming up with Tony Gonzalez Arroyo coming to us from UAM. Tell us about twisted matrix models. Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, first of all, to the organizers for inviting me, uh, Anush and, and the rest. Uh, it's, a, it's always for me a pleasure to come here. It's my second time in person, but I participated last year in another workshop, but remotely, which is not a nice experience anyway. Uh, but okay, fortunately I was able to make it and to, to come here in person. Okay, so I changed a little bit the title that I had proposed, but the content is the same. It's just, I, I chose this, this name. Uh, I was here four years ago in person and I gave a talk about twisted matrix models. So <laughs> this is, uh, the reason why I will tell you about what has happened in these four years. So I will mostly concentrate you with it. But I'm aware that this sort of, the audience is very mixed. So I, I will start by, of course, recalling what is this twisted matrix models, which many people will not know, and, and why do we think they're interesting. And then I will mostly report on results which have been obtained lately. I mean, even this year, okay? so. Let me start. Uh, if it works. Not. Ah, uh, this sometimes happens. Okay, okay, fine. So, uh, what are these twisted matrix models? Well, and first of all, let me tell you why they are interesting. The reason is because these matrix models, which are matrix, uh, just ma mat uh, models of very few matrices, they are equivalent to large n lattice gauge field theories at infinite volume and infinite n, of course, no? So it's a matrix model, which is equivalent. There are several proofs depending on, on the theory in question. I will mostly keep uh, track of this perturbative proof, which I gave 40 years ago with my collaborator Okawa, uh, uh, and that applies to all the theories. In some cases, there is additional proofs. Okay, so uh, of course, the reason that you might be interested is because they, this is a way to understand, I mean, it's, uh, it's formally, if you solve this theory, you have large hand gauge theories in infinite volume, okay? So you're, uh, you're interested because large hand is a good uh, ingredient in connecting with other things like holography string. Okay, now the mo uh, to construct these models is very simple. All you have to do is to embed the translation group as a, a group of a joint action in the group itself. Okay, so you're mapping a translation group, which is the an abelian group of this type. I mean, this is a discrete. Uh, group uh, finite dimensional, because you're thinking, first of all, finite dimensional, and into the, the group. Okay, so what you need for that is to have these matrices, matrices that satisfy this relation with this Z are elements of the center. And of course, I'm not going to go into the technical details because I mean, once you motiva you're motivated, you can find that by yourself. There are lots of publications. Uh, how to choose these guys, okay? But the main thing is that there is a way to choose these guys to, to allow all these things to happen. Huh? And all these things is that, well, first of all, if this, I'm talking first of about SUN, then uh, this group, I can choose this matrices such that the, the, each one gamma mu, there's one per direction. So it's a D-dimensional translation group. Huh? And uh, if you translate L mu times in one direction, it's like a torus, a finite discrete torus, okay, of, L, of length L mu in each direction. But of course, there is no torus because this is just acting on a matrix, in a single matrix. You can remove the index n and you just replace it by a single matrix. <clears throat> there are the easiest thing is to take, make your life very simple by deciding that all the directions are the same and then choosing one L to represent all the, that, that would mean that your, your uh, lattice would be effective, lattice would be symmetric in all directions. And since the number of degrees of freedom in the group is equal to N square, okay, 
the number of points of this lattice is always equal, always is going to be L square or a divisor of L square. And you wanted to have it L square. So you can do this choice. And in such a, in such a way, you are sort of embedding this discrete group uh, all the, uh, into this. Uh, and typically, uh, this, as you can see here, L to the power, the dimension, the total volume, effective volume, because well, these translations are re not really translations, they're equivalent, is equal to n squared. That would be the optimum. Okay. So this relation here is a generalization of the Clifford algebra that you t teach your students, hmm? except that now uh, two becomes n. Okay. This two, this minus one, the anti, anti commutator now becomes this relation here. But everything goes very much the same. For example, proving that it has a solution, the number of uh, independent solutions, et cetera, et cetera, how you go from one solution to another, et cetera, works pretty much the same, okay? So it is very important, and I introduced this in the first paper, this family of matrices, which are like the equivalent of Fourier, because if you apply this translation to these matrices, they are matrices, okay? I can write them explicitly. Uh, they translate with a phase, which is going to be the equivalent of momentum, okay? So in this way, you decompose a matrix, an element of the algebra into different co 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 coefficients times these matrices, and it's like Fourier. It becomes Fourier, okay? Once you do that, your theory that has no space acquires something similar to space because it gets momenta. And if you analyze the Feynman rules and, and you look at the thing, you find out the first thing is that you get propagators, like in normal perturbation theory on a volume, but they are of course now propagators which are because of the constraint that L mu to the power D uh, L, sorry, gamma mu to the power L mu is equal to one. Uh, they are equivalent to propagators in a finite lattice, hmm? which the size of the lattice is determined by the group actually by this L hat, which could be the square root of N or N depending on the dimension, okay? So that's part one. So. This is an equivalent. Every planar diagram is the same in both theories. The propagators are exactly the same, okay? And, and uh, that applies for planar diagrams. They look just the same. So they, the result will be the same. You compute in both theories. What is the difference? The other difference is the non-planar diagrams. Non-planar diagrams in the ordinary <laughs> calculation, they are down by powers one over n squared, the genus of the surface in which they're. Here is different. Because what happens when you know, a planar diagram like this one here is that it acquires a phase. And this phase is a rapidly oscillating because it has here L hat in the numerator and kills this non-planar with respect to the planar. So when you take the limit and goes to infinity, your lattice becomes infinite, okay? Because of part one and all these diagrams which are non-planar got suppressed. So you get back perturbation theory, okay? In the infinite volume limit. So that's, that's the proof essentially. <laughs> Uh, and um, I will show you the simplest example, hmm? which is by itself interesting, which is the two dimensional principle chiral model, which is a nice theory, which mimics many of the properties of gauge theories in four dimensions, but it's in two dimension. <coughs> and uh, when I, you apply, you take the theory on the lattice, hmm? uh, and when you apply the rule, you get the, uh, this, this uh, action, Okay, which is uh, in both a single matrix, U. So the only degree of freedom is U, which is an SUN matrix, okay? It has these gamma mu's here, which are fixed. I mean, you can just solve the equation before, put it fixed, and you use them, okay? So, and that's the, that's the action, okay? So it's, it's the, uh, you have to integrate over U, and this is the action, you have to wait, you do normal, uh, waiting uh, and, but you can of course do perturbation theory hmm? because my statement is that it's equivalent for all values of the coupling, including perturbation theory. So it's a statement that is not just testable by computers, it's, comp it's, it's testable by doing analytic work, okay? So, so uh, you, do, you take this case because also you have more analytic work in the, in the part which is, uh, infinite volume, infinite n. And uh, here, this is to, or, to order lambda square, okay? To second order. And you can verify, you can see that the two theories 
This is the, the value of the internal energy, essentially the expectation value of, of, the, of the action, <coughs> that in the n equal infinity limit, they become the same. The coefficient here is minus one eight, lambda divided by eight, and here, lambda squared divided by 256, okay? In both cases. So the, the, uh, what I was claiming by explicit calculation holds to order lambda square, and the, uh, the corrections are different. Because remember, the corrections have a different source, okay? So they look pretty much the same. There's this three here instead of these two here, but then there is this term here. This term here depends on this uh, value, which I didn't emphasize before <laughs> enough, which is the flux, which enters in the commutation relations in the gamma mu, gamma nu. Uh, it's an element of the center. So there is a coefficient divided by n, two pi i k divided by n, no? and this k is the flux. So you have this freedom to move this value, okay? So this is the only thing that depends on K. If this is fixed, if this doesn't grow, this, is the, this goes to zero when N goes to infinity, but in principle it's a function of K and N. If, if this diverges, it's, it will not be true. This can be computed in, the, in this particular example. And what you get is this, okay? You get this, this shape here, okay? So I am plotting this function of two variables, K and N, as a function of the ratio, K over L, okay? And I computed it for many different values of n, okay? And many different values of k. And then you get, of course, a discrete number because k is an integer and n are these guys. And you get this thing, which looks smooth, but it isn't smooth because if you, you realize that at the, when the ratio k over n becomes an integer, it becomes, it becomes funny. Uh, here, you see what, when k over n goes to zero, k over n, comes to one half, one third, one fourth. It behaves, uh, you can even prove that this is going to happen all the way. So this function will not have, will not be continuous uh, because it will be discontinuous in the, in the, uh, at all the rational points, which of course is dense, okay? So <coughs> curiously, <coughs> what, is ma what matters is that this does not diverge, okay? Uh, that this stays finite because remember this is divided by n squared so it's just the coefficient of one over n squared so of course you want to make the, make it small to make the coefficient small the correction small but uh, as long as it does not diverge even this divergence here this apparent divergence is not strong enough it diverges like one over like square root of n okay so divided by n squared still diverges but it would not be a one over n squared correction it would be a one over n smaller. So anyway, curiously, I wrote a paper with uh, a former uh, student of mine, well, that was his uh, master thesis, in which, uh, but this guy is, uh, happens to be a mathematician, <laughs> so that we, we saw that not in this particular problem, but in another problem, which is also the same type, there is an optimal choice. And the optimal choice is the Fibonacci, to take the Fibonacci sequence. So you have to take, if you want to take the n goes to infinity limit, n has to be one of the Fibonacci numbers and k two before. If you take the limit k over n, you get this number here. This is related to the golden ratio, three minus square root of n divided by two, which is this value here. And it holds okay, in this particular case and in all, all the other cases that I've looked at, okay? So if you want to take the large n limit, which is actually what you want, let's take the Fibonacci now, uh, sequence to, be, to do it, okay? But nevertheless, you see, it doesn't matter that much here. Okay, <clears throat> this was up to order two where I calculated perturbatively the, the two theories, okay? Uh, unfortunately, well, for the time being, it's, it's feasible, but I haven't co computed perturbatively the third order coefficient. But for the theory in infinite volume, it has been computed long time ago by Vicari and Rossi. And there you have an analytic result, which gives a function of N. So. This is the coefficient of lambda to the power cube. And this is the result here as a function of one over n squared. Now, these, are, these numbers here are the results of a numerical calculation of the coefficient using a technique which is very useful, which is called NSPT, that people are using to compute higher order coefficients in perturbation theory on the lattice, okay? So you get, and, and you can also do that in the fourth order coefficient, but this time this is not known. So we use NSPT to the theory with infinite volume, and we also did NSPT or the matrix model. And, and this is the result you get in the infinite 
volume matrix uh, uh, theory, and this is the result you get in our case, and you take the limit and goes to infinity, and the agreement of the coefficients is up to the degree of precision that you can get, it's, it's correct. So this is a work that is not yet published. It is this month, okay? Now, let me move on to uh, gauge theories, okay? Uh, well, the threat, I'm not going to talk much about this because, okay, although some of the results are new, uh, this was actually the first of these uh, mo models that was studied in full detail. The theory, uh, the equivalent, the matrix model is called TK model. It was formulated in the same paper in 1983 that I'm mentioning before, uh, but he, it has been studied both perturbatively and non-perturbatively uh, recently, only in the last, say, 10 years or so. And, and the agreement is, is uh, huge, in both in perturbation theory and in non-perturbation theory, you can compare with the analytic results wherever, whenever you get them. But you can also do high-order NSPT in this theory, and it has been done. But you would like to do many orders because then you can see how the series goes, whether there is a uh, renormal on singularity, all things that can be studied very well because this is a matrix model and the number of degrees of freedom is, is easier to, to handle, okay? So uh, non-perturbatively, it has also been studied up to N equal 1369. The, the funny numbers is because it's the square of a prime, 37 square. So you have to think in this case, it's four dimensions that it's the equivalent is like having a lattice of size 37, 37 four dimensions because that's effective, okay? The, if you are finite n, okay, you are not n equal infinity, but no numerical results are obtained in equal, in equal infinity. So it's very important to know the corrections when you do finite n, okay? Uh, and last but not least, and of course it's the most important thing, you can use these results to obtain results about the continuum theory, not just the lattice theory. Okay, and it has already been done over the years for the string tension, the renormal coupling constant, and the thing which is new in the sense that it was not there four years ago is the calculation of the meson, meson spectrum uh, in the limit when n goes to infinity and nf is much smaller than n. Therefore, they, these fermions that make are just probes; they, they are not dynamical. Okay, so it's the quench approximation is correct and so on. Uh, you can see here how well. The results you obtain from this matrix model match with the beta function, with the two coefficients of the beta function that are known analytically. Of course, the, the other coefficients depend on the, your definition of lambda, huh? but this matches very well with the uh, thing. So you are really approaching the continuum limit. This is an improved coupling because naive coupling doesn't work that well as everybody knows from long time ago. Okay, so the recent result that I was mentioning is just this. Okay, the masses, okay? So I will not spend much time on this because I will go to supersymmetric theory, uh, but essentially in the end, you get what you wanted, which is the mass. It, it depends because we are thinking uh, of uh, mesons, it depends on the quark masses also. So it depends on the coupling and the quark mass. So you, have, you, you need two values to renormalize, okay? So I use the string tension as the unit, hmm? And, and the mass of the pion as, the, as a measure of the, of, of the mass of the quark. Okay, so I traded my bare parameters to physical parameters so that people can compare with the table calculation. And this is the masses that you obtain. This will be in the chiral limit, and this will be the correction to the chiral limit. Eh? And these are the values we obtain. It can be improved very much because the limitation here is n is relatively small, but anyway. So these are typical plots of this, uh, like what the, how does the correlator look as an exponential decay? That's uh, an example for the row. Uh, I mean, the standard uh, quality is the same, mm, certainly not worse than what people get in all other lattice gauge theory calculations, and it, it can be done in smaller computers. Okay, that's a scaling also. If you take the ratio of the mass to the, to the the string tension, the ratio has to go to a constant in the continuum limit, and these are the ratios. The values change a lot because you, can, you saw, saw that before, but the ratio stays stable. The one which doesn't is this one, which is the zero plus state, which is a nuisance, uh, but uh, okay, because that's the typical problem with the scalar uh, mesons. 
which is also true for ordinary QCD. Okay. So now the last part would be about uh, Susi Yam Mills, hmm? uh, because this can also be applied to Susi Yam Mills. We, we mentioned that before and, and we did it because you can also put uh, the uh, Majorana fermion uh, uh, in, in, with, uh, in the adjoint representation and do the same thing and also prove perturbatively that it, it's equivalent. So the theory also becomes uh, equivalent, and we have studied this. Of course, now you have the theory that you're studying is actually a massive Duino theory, but as was probably mentioned in the talks, this is a one case where you, if you tune the Duino mass to zero, you recover SUSY, okay? So it's, that's what other people like George Berner and other people are doing, you understand? But this is N equal infinity, that's the difference. So our, our work, which is 50 pages long, and has a lot of technical details, and if you are interested, I can give them all, but just to, this is a flash of what can be done. Uh, uh, in the end, we, we saw, uh, yeah, what we did is try to uh, fix, fix the scale, which is one thing you have to do normally when you do a lattice, is to relate the coupling constant with uh, some quantity that you use a unit of energy, okay? But of course, you can use as a unit of energy anything, that has dimension of energy. So there are many ways to do that. Of course, in the continuum limit, it doesn't matter. It's just changing units. But if you're not in the continuum limit, you have scaling violations and it doesn't have to be exactly the same. So anyway, we decided to do it redundantly. So we took three units and computed for each of the three units how they evolve with the couplings, okay? And which now are many couplings because we have the coupling constant of the gauge fields and the mass of the gluid, okay? And for one, one of the methods uses so-called gradient flow. I'm not going to enter into the details because there's no time to explain this thing. And furthermore, most people are not interested. So the interested people can read the paper or ask me. Uh, but this is sort of a graph that shows that the three methods agree. Actually, the one which is more canonical is this gradient flow method, huh? although we modified it slightly. This is another method that we sort of use also a variant of this was used for the string tension. It's based on Wilson loops, not, not just a plaquette. And you see here the comparison. These are the values of the, this is just the mass of the, of the gluinum, okay? The different lines are the different coupling constants. So you have four different coupling constants and five, in this case, say five different values of the mass of the gluinum. So in each case, you can compute whatever energy, and you can compare the ratio, and, and the ratios come out, as you can see. That's what I was saying before. Things change, hmm? the scale changes, but the ratio doesn't, okay? Which is what has to happen, okay? Uh, and this is, of course, the limit of the massless Bruno limit. So you have computed the scales for all of these values, but now you have to extrapolate to the limit in which the mass of the Bruno is zero. Okay, this is what is called kappa critical because we use Wilson fermions and we have a determination, two determinations. Everything is based on redundancy, two determinations of kappa critical with different uh, techniques, uh, which agree to four or five decimal places. You take the limit, these are the different limits uh, for the different values of the coupling constant. So this is the mass, essentially, the mass of the, of the Gluino. And these, are, these different, are different values of the coupling constant. So when you extrapolate, you just have, you have no masses because the Gluino has zero mass. So this gives you the scale. Now, if you have the scale as a function of the coupling constant, you have the beta function. So how does that, this compare to the beta function that you're expecting? And these are for two different definitions of the coupling on the lattice. The comparison of the results we just obtained, this extrapolation with the beta function with two coefficients of the beta function fixed and we don't have the precision to determine the third one because that would depend, that would be different for these two. The, the, the fits in this case involve just uh, the lambda parameter, okay, which is just the displacement. Okay? It's a constant here in this. So what the conclusion is this thing can be done, this can be determined, and you can get, the, this is another picture, just to more or less finish. Uh, which we did recently, this has been presented in the last conference, which is to put this within a much bigger scale, do the same determination of the scale 
four different values of the number of flavors. So here we normally take, like many people do in the lattice, the Majorana ferment to be NF equal a half. Uh, but we also have results with NF equal one and NF equal two, okay? So uh, this is the, how these things go. The interesting thing is when the mass, of course, of the quark becomes very high, it's like no having. And these quarks are very massive and they decouple, okay? So the scale in this very heavy case tends to the scale in pure gauge theory, okay? So everything matches nicely as, it, as expected. So that was all. And just to, to finish, just to mention that uh, a kind of summary to say that, okay, uh, the limitation is the value of n, but it's just multiplying matrices essentially. So, and with GPUs and things, you can do this very effectively. Uh, we, so it is uh, easy to, to go beyond. Uh, some observables are harder than others. That's a limitation. And furthermore, and finally, just to go, just to also to, to meet what was this, uh, the previous talk, is that uh, this is just, I showed you two examples, or three examples, okay? But it can be extended to many theories. Hmm? From CPN minus one, where you have a very nice theory, which has to be studied, it has not been studied numerically, but I will, uh, I can write it down for you, all the way to other theories, which are very interesting. Like for example, the Veneziano limit, in which you have NF flavors, where NF over N doesn't go to zero, when N goes to infinity, and it can be studied uh, by these two-state mat uh, matrix models. QCD with two quarks in the two index representation, also, which is also very interesting. And I don't know how to solve all the problems that you were mentioning. And it's a nice thing that I'm here. I can discuss with, with him uh, that the, it can also be formulated in the A4 star lattice and everything goes through like in this thing. So I can write the equivalent of this uh, twisted matrix model for the N equal four, D equal four, not D equal three, D equal four, but probably D equal three can also be done. I'm not sure. Okay. Okay, that's all. So this is just a summary of what I was uh, saying previously. So thank you very much. We have time for questions and questions coming in already. <laughs> um, very nice. Um, uh, I guess when you use the main wall fermion, you could use the main wall fermions, right? And then your chiral, case. Oh, no, have we, no we, have we, we used Wilson fermions. Yeah, but you could, right? I mean, there's nothing. We viral. could. Yeah. And, then, and then in the chiral case, for example, the pi, on, the, the, the pi on mass would be just proportional, let's say, whatever, it'd be proportional to the quark mass, I guess the square of it, right? And that's exact, right? It's, it's for all values. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, yeah, sure. I mean, uh, it's much, you can also use overlap. Yeah, okay, but the point is that linearity yeah. on the side, which way is it? I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm here you, you lose when with the you, you don't it's, have an exact. It's not a polynomial, you just get one term forever, right? Where? Well, the relationship. Um, no. Uh, the pi on mass squared will be proportional to the quark mass exactly. Is that correct? Yeah, actually it is. Yeah, I mean. It, it's here, quark. I mean, I didn't show the plot. No, but I'm just saying. But that you that's... can compute the quark mass, what is called MPCAC. Right. So, which uh, is the violation of the word identity. Right. That's and, a, and that's been used uh, since the right, ages. That's a property of the, and, of the and, large N limit that it's completely given by that first term, right? No, I mean, uh, I, uh, it just, I think there are corrections too. I mean, there, I, are, I mean, there are corrections. But, but, they, but it be, behaves this way. I mean, yeah. the mass, the pi mass square, which can be computed. Okay, so there are corrections, yeah. Goes, goes linearly and, with the, pretty well, yeah. but I'm not aware that this can be proven to be zero. Oh, okay, I was just wondering. I'm not aware of that. Okay, the, the, your method, there's another method by um, uh, Nuremberger and Narayana, which they don't use twisting, but they use a larger lattice. Is, is that comparable yeah. in terms of uh, answers? Okay. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, there are several proposals for doing the same thing. And, and they are not in contradiction. I mean, what you want is to really implement the Iwichikawai idea in a way which works, which doesn't in the original Iwichikawai. I just wondered which was computationally most efficient. And yeah, I, I, nobody has gone this far 
not perturbation theory, I mean, not just the last number, it's just even the first number. <laughs> nobody has done the calculation in perturbation theory, nobody has done this in SPT. So it's, I, I, I think uh, they are a long way. This is very, very simple. To do this is just as simple as the, Uchi, uh, the original Iguchikawa area. Okay, so, but it can be combined with other things. I mean, I, I wrote a paper with, uh, with Neuberger. <laughs> mixing, gone, mixing. You've gone much Larsen, farther than anybody Larsen else. Larsen and twisting. <laughs> yeah, you've gone much farther yeah, with this yeah, than anybody else. There's probably yeah, no comparison. Sure. I mean, at this level, there is no competition because the, the other results are lacking. Okay? So, a um, couple of questions. Sorry. Uh, number one, um, since the dimensional reduction is with a, well, it's a fuzzy torus essentially, right? So the, the gamma matrices that you implement, uh, yeah. implement a discrete translation version with a twist, which is a yeah. fuzzy version of a torus. Um, have you checked that rotational invariance is restored? Um, yeah, uh, to the extent, uh, uh, you even break CP, but we, um, I mean, it's, uh, I don't know if explicitly we did a paper computing. Yeah, no, that's the, the, that's the question of the violations of, of rotation yeah, variance, whether yeah. that can be kind of used to. Yeah, well, understand. but that's that's like an ordinary lattice. No, theory. I, I know. There's, there's, no, no, difference somehow, okay. huh? there's uh, no difference somehow. There's no difference as far as I can tell from that, uh, the, the same problem that you can ask. But we have checked many things like that and they always work. I mean, but okay. You can also do the perturbative calculation to see it works. Sure. No, I was wondering if the numerical stuff, you checked it to make sure that things are kind of... Yeah, I mean, we okay. can, yeah, we can certainly do that. So uh, on this statement about fuzzy spaces, you can also do it with fuzzy spheres. Is there any complication when when, when does it that way? Well, here, the, the flux is very important. You see, I mean, for, uh, saying about fuzzy, fuzzy torus that you say, uh, this was invented before Kohn and Riffel wrote their paper. And actually, we wrote a paper general, making this in the continuum. <laughs> that was the first time you get the, the U1 uh, non commutative field theory. Sure. So, so that's uh, somehow the history went uh, in a very funny way because this discrete, discrete version came before, and then we wrote this generalized continuum. So, I don't know how to do it for the fascist sphere, but the problem with the fascist sphere, I, I think, is the this there is only one flux, I guess. And here you have many fluxes, one per plane. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't know, I don't know. I, I didn't think enough about that, but you, ha you have translations. This is very important because here where you're somehow embedding translation. And if you put a sphere. Well, you get rotations, that's the point. Yeah, the yeah, really yeah but that's a completely different thing. Group. Yeah, it's a very different, they are not, it's non-commutative. It's a different story. Well, it's non-commutative here also because you have the gamma matrices. No, because the no, the, the, there is an isomorphism between the two groups. Which acts by a joint action yeah, that commutes you? too, because it has a phase, and the phase it appears with its complex conjugate. So it's a, an exact isomorphism of the two groups. How would you do and twisting it's an on a sphere? Hmm? How would you do the twisting on a fuzzy sphere? Uh, you, you take the twisted, the twisted theory, and you do you reduce that on the fuzzy sphere. I think that that can be done, but we can I take mean, this offline. Well, uh, it's interesting to think about it, but I never thought about it. No, it's fine. It. <laughs> yeah. How would you study the quark anti quark potential in twisted models? In what models? I mean, if I want to yeah. estimate Actually, the, the quark potential. anti quark potential, yeah. is there a method in the twisted model? Because everything is what, what, what just one did? hypercube. Yeah, what we did, yeah, there, are, uh, there is a way to deal with asymmetric things actually invented by Das and Kogut in an old paper, just to study finite temperature, which is to make asymmetric couplings. Then you can make the lattice spacing different in each direction by tuning the coupling. And then you can study even finite temperature phase transitions. That was the paper, but it's also uh, useful to do these other things that you can make it asymmetric by making the couplings in each plane different. So that's, that's an interesting thing to, to be explored, which I did actually, I must say. Uh, uh, concerning the, the potential, this is a very nice picture. That's what I put in the back slide, which is the, like, uh, is, this is 
the logarithm, unfortunately it's not written here, of the Wilson loop, of a square Wilson loop, or, sorry, of the derivative with respect to the size of the logarithm of the Wilson loop, which is a finite quantity. And, and uh, people who say, well, how do you know on the lattice that there is, uh, that there is uh, actually um, confinement, that the string tension, well, it's just to see, I mean, uh, what people on the lattice can do is to look here. And uh, confinement means that the, this number is not zero, okay? You have to extrapolate this huge amount of, you have the information here, but of course, confinement means infinite, point, infinite. So you just have to go here. Furthermore, the slope is known because it's string theory somehow. So this is the slope is pi over 12. <laughs> so actually, I mean, you have a lot of information. It is similar to the quantity core potential, but this is much richer and it has to be universal. Uh, so here is computed with different scales and put in a single curve. So this is a quantity I talk to many people computed uh, with string, uh, different string models but uh, nobody has come to something like that to say, well, why? Because that part is easy, but the second coefficient is not equal to Nambugot. Hmm? I think so, that's a good place. Okay, to sorry, I'm discussion. too much time. You can resume over the lunch, but before then we yeah, have yeah, sure. uh, to thank Tony again. Yeah.